Madame Susan Sausage has shuffled the playing cards. The magician takes them back. One playing card is seen to propel through the air. It is the Ace of Diamonds. The magician snaps his fingers for no reason. He reaches into his pocket where he returns with another Ace. The Ace of Spades. He then takes the deck and slams it. The deck of cards is seen to vanish, leaving behind one playing card. It is the Ace of Hearts. As the magician distracts you by making you look here, here and here, that gave him enough time to place the fourth Ace on the table. I'm Daddy Madison and this is Effing Aces. Madison, welcome back. Thank for being here. In this video, I'm going to teach you something called effing aces. Effing obviously is a little bit short and it stands for finding aces. What else could it have possibly meant? This is a cool and snappy trick. It's a way of finding all four aces, one after another, in a shuffle deck in a very cool way. Way. You hand the deck over to Susan Sausage. She shuffles them thoroughly and as soon as she gives you that deck back, bang, one playing card shoots out of the deck. It's the first ace. Snap, a card vanishes from the deck. It is in your pocket. It is another ace. Bang, you bang the deck. The deck vanishes, leaving behind one playing card. It is an ace. The final ace is a lovely surprise. It is found mysteriously already with the other three aces. Now this is a trick that was heavily inspired by Dynamo way before he was Dynamo. I'm gonna tell that story too in this video, but right now, get yourself a deck of playing cards and let's learn effing aces. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. This is actually a really cool trick. A trick that I love doing. A good way to start a trick that involves four playing cards. This is a way of finding those four playing cards in a very magical way. Charlie, as you already know, this trick was inspired by Dynamo before he was Dynamo. Back when he was just Steve. I was at the Bradford Magic Circle and there was this kid lecturing. It was, it was his first ever lecture and his lecture notes were printed on one piece of A4 paper and that baffled me a little bit and it made me pay more attention and this kid was amazing with playing cards. I went straight up to him afterwards, introduced myself and we became tight Charlie who was a really good friend of mine and of course he still is with both Bradford lads you know but up until meeting him I'd never known of this style of magic before a way of just revealing four playing cards four of a kind and that'd be the trick didn't really make sense to me until I started playing with it this is the first one I came up with and I still use it to this day Charlie and you know me Charlie it might be easy, but I talk a lot because I want to get that information down. I don't want to leave my audience asking questions. Should we get straight to it? Should we get into it? Should I do some demonstrations? That's right, Charlie. I'm Daniel Madison. You're Charlie Madison. Who the <laughs> is this guy? This is effing aces. In all seriousness, this is actually a pretty cool trick. You give the deck out to Susan, she shuffles them and gives them back to you. You cut the deck once, a playing card propels away from the deck. Ace of spades. You then reach into your pocket and return with another ace. Ace of clubs this time. You then take the deck right in front of them and slam it between your hands. The deck seems to vanish, leaving behind one playing card. The ace of diamonds. Then as you make them look away for a split second, You've already got the fourth and final ace on the table. I'm Daniel Madison and this is effing aces. Yes. Right from the very start, I have an extra deck of playing cards in my right pocket. This is a brand new deck. It's in brand new deck order. That's very important. And it's gonna go in my right pocket. We'll get to this in a moment. It's not actually, it's not necessarily part of this trick. But you're gonna love what I'm gonna do with this. And this is something that I take advantage of whenever I can. 
So we'll focus on the trick for now. You want the four aces. You need to start with them or start the trick with them all on top of the deck. So for this to make more sense, for this to be more magical, the playing cards have to be shuffled by a participant, by Susan Sausage. So when I give Susan the deck to shuffle, I palm away the four aces. You don't necessarily have to do that if you don't want to. You can have the aces on top of the deck, retain them in that position uh, with finger two. Very simple idea of shuffling the deck face up. When I say face up, I mean so that you can see the faces of the cards. Now, if I shuffle, I'm keeping about 10, 15 playing cards in place on top of the deck by simply holding on with finger two. Very easy idea, very simple idea. While I'm doing this, I'm talking about the trick. I'm addressing the audience, talking to Susan. Meanwhile, you can all see the deck being shuffled. For a lot of magicians, for a lot of people, this will be enough. This will be enough of a, another, enough of an idea to translate to your audience to Susan the deck, that the deck is being thoroughly shuffled. Me being me, I like to palm those aces away before I give the deck to be shuffled. So just before we get in ready for the trick, I will, I will put those play cards in a palm, hand the deck out and I will just stand here holding four aces in something of Modified Gambler's Cop, kind of a lateral palm. There's no real name for it. I'm just clipping all those four aces uh, to the flannel part of my hand with finger two, just so that Susan can't see them. Note that the aces are face up, and I also hand the deck across to Susan face up. This implies that I want her to shuffle the playing cards face up. I don't say this, I don't make a point of this, because I don't want it to become a thing. I don't want to say to her, oh, you need to shuffle these face up because then she's going to start trying to reverse engineer this or try to figure out why would he possibly need them? And then they're going to look closer. They're going to be looking. So I just give them the deck face up and then they shuffle the face up. If she turns it face down and shuffles, I don't really care because when I get it back, I'm going to turn it face up again. However, if I give it to her like this, she will more than likely give me it back like this. Now, this allows me to take the playing cards face up and load them directly on top of the aces and I do this without looking at my hands. I say this a lot in my videos, you don't look at your own deception because that instructs them, um, subconsciously instructs them to look where you're looking so don't look at, this, at the deception and neither will they. So when I take the playing cards back, I wait for a moment, so I keep the dirty hand here and I wait for a moment and then when I'm, when I'm comfortable that they're looking directly in my eyes, I slowly move that deck back on top of those aces. And then I'm in position to start the trick. So all that just to start the trick. Now, Susan shuffled this deck thoroughly. She's handed it back and I can go straight into this trick. This makes the trick look, look more impossible or so much more difficult. And it makes you look, the performer look like you've got more skill than you actually have because it looks like you're finding those aces in a shuffled deck. If you didn't shuffle the deck to begin with, then it's kind of redundant. So it's a very important part of the trick and that's why I like them to do it. The more that they can do, the more that they can get involved and interact and, and be physically part of the trick by touching these things, then you're onto a winner. Especially when this trick then relies on you giving them playing cards one at a time for that final kicker. We'll get to that when we get to that. The whole point of this is once you uh, reveal the first ace, you're going to give it to Susan. So she's going to be holding the cards. We'll get to that in a moment. So now you've loaded the aces on top of the deck. They're now on top of the deck. For the first trick, for the first card, it's the top playing card, right? So. I'm going to go into a snap D, which I taught a few videos back. Just go a few videos back on my channel, and you'll find uh, the lesson in how to do this. <laughs> and obviously, you have to be able to catch. You don't have to do that, but I like the first one to be kind of snappy, kind of fast and quick and to the point. Uh, another idea that I used to do was kind of a top shot, modified top shot. If I grip the deck very tightly and pull down with finger four with my pinky, then I can 
allow that card to pop away from the deck. The deck doesn't change order of the other three aces that are on top and I've revealed the first ace. However, before we do that, I don't want Susan or anybody else to believe that that card was on the top all along or that she somehow magically shuffled it to the top. It kind of portrays, it kind of, it lets them know that I've somehow manipulated that card on top of the deck. I want it to look like I've found that card. So when she gives me the deck back, I've loaded the aces. I stand here, I'm gonna do a few false shuffles. Just a few kind of, they call it Hindu, an overhand or I can't remember. But basically I'm just pulling the bottom part of the deck. One, two, deck's still in the same order, the aces on top. So I do this, it looks like I'm cutting, cutting to the first ace. So I go one, two, and as soon as I'm there, I look away, I don't look at this, and then I catch the card. As there's something beautiful about not looking at what you're doing. Um, and you don't really need to look at it. And when I say don't look, I don't mean make a point by looking into the sky or saying I'm not even gonna look. Just there's a nice little moment where you think, have I done this right? Well, let's find out. And then the card is there. So that's card one. You, right now you're gonna set a precedent. You're gonna put it into Susan's open hand face up. So you're gonna to say to her, Susan, hold your hand out. I'll keep your hand like this for me. So she's gonna stand there like this, like with, with the pressure of it, with the responsibility that you've just given her. When you instruct somebody to hold the hand like this, then you're, you're instructing them to, to be like that until you give another command, because that is a command. If you say, hold the ace, she's gonna hold it however she wants, however she understands what the word, what those words mean. Hold this playing card. That can mean, that can mean so many things because I, I decide how I hold a playing card. Thank you very much. But if I say to you, hold your hand like this and keep it like that, then she's not gonna all of a sudden go, you know, she's not, and she's gonna stay like this. So it's important not to say, hold on to this. Just say, put your hand like this for me uh, and keep the ace where everybody can see it. Or maybe you need, maybe you don't need it, but sometimes it's wise to give an extra instruction. Like hold your hand like this, you put the card on top, just keep it there where everybody can see it. We're gonna go for the other ace or we're gonna go for another ace. Or what I like to do, don't tell them what's coming next. I think of this point when you're showing the first ace, they kind of know at this point what's coming anyway. So your language is kind of up to you. It's kind of dependent on the situation and on the performance, the environment, the audience, etc. So the first card has been realized, the first card. So you've done the cuts, you do the snap D, you've instructed them to hold the hand out, the cards are in the hand. You're gonna to go to the second playing card. While all this is happening, while all this is happening, I, with the deck, I've pushed the top two cards over and then pulled them back with a break underneath. So finger two is now underneath the top two playing cards. Very easy idea. All I'm doing is holding a break between the top two cards. So that the top two cards are squarely together, nice and tight, and I have a big gap underneath them because what happens next is I'm gonna come back to the deck with my free hand that I've just put a playing card down back to the deck and I'm gonna hold all the cards from above as if I'm holding the entire deck. This is what it looks like for this hand to hold the entire deck. So I'm gonna do that, but I'm only going to grip those top two playing cards. So I go like this, my hand like this. Now this is a very specific image. My thumb is round about the middle of the back, finger one curled over on top, and the other three fingers have made their way almost all the way across the deck. So if I stand like this, you can see the side of the deck at the top. If I stand just like this, head on, all of a sudden you can't see the side of the deck, you can just see the top. This is very important because what we're gonna do next is steal the deck and leave those two cards in hand. So it looks like this, I've got my break, I put the ace in the hand like this, I come back to the deck, and now I go to my pocket. It still looks like I'm holding the deck because of the shape of my hand, but really I've just got two playing cards because I've stolen the whole deck. Now you don't want to rush this. It's gonna feel like you wanna rush this. You wanna, you're gonna feel like you, you wanna go fast because you're holding on to almost a completely full deck of playing cards. You're holding on to 49 playing cards. Unless you've got a duplicate in there, so you're holding on to 50 playing cards. And there's no kind of, it sounds weird to say, and maybe it's a bad teacher of me to say this, but 
There's no method to this other than taking the deck and going to your pocket. Now, I, I, a few notes, I do make sure that that deck is beyond uh, this line, beyond the, 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 beyond the red line. This is known as the red line where your finger joins up with your hand. If it's beyond the red line, then I know, I know I'm safe because when I take the deck away and curl my hand down, my thumb can line up with my finger and hide whatever's in the hand. And the finger can still stay outstretched and pointed because if it goes down like this, it looks like something in it. If the fingers are open, it looks like you can't be holding on to something. All the while, uh, the clunge of my thumb is pressing the deck into my hand. Fingers uh, three and four are also pulling that deck into my hand. So in real time, it, it, it's not really even a method. I'm just taking that deck to my pocket. What I'm relying on is this hand, the body language, the behavior is very, it's slow enough for nobody to, to look but more importantly you can still see the deck as far as anybody's concerned the deck is here because I'm, I'm holding on to it all I've done is transfer the deck from this hand to this hand I'm taking the deck into this hand so the deck is now here so what happens next I put the, the first card down take those two cards from above it looks like I'm taking the deck this hand, the dirty hand takes the entire deck to my pocket what I do to get to the pocket, I come back and I say the next card is in my pocket. So I'm giving myself the justification and the reason for this arm to be going down here anyway. And by the time I finish that sentence, that is when they look at the pocket. So they're not looking at the pocket first. I don't say the next card goes to my pocket. And then I go to my pocket. I don't want to do that. I'm setting myself up for trouble there. I, I need that instruction or that statement to, uh, to have finished by the time my hand's in my pocket. Uh, for the psychology of that, for that to work, it, and it also justifies everything. It makes everything just look so natural when I go, the next card is in my pocket. Now, I finished a sentence when my hand's in my pocket, so nobody was looking at this moment. Nobody was looking at this, or nobody was looking at my pocket before I got to it, because, because I didn't tell them to. So I'm here, the next card is in my pocket. Now I just dump the entire deck in my pocket and I come back with the top playing card, which is the next ace, the ace of diamonds in my case. I now very easily put the ace into Susan's hand, get this hand ready, come back, and I say the, the third ace, watch the deck. So big empty open hand. Now this is so that I can do a few things, show that this is empty, that I'm not holding anything with the deck. I carefully put the entire deck into my hand. Now, all this time they believe that this is the deck, all this time. So I'm stood here holding this deck. I don't want to be hiding it. I don't want to, want to look like I'm trying to hide something because that's going to make people look. I just want to be stood here very natural. As long as my hand is in this position, as long as they can see the top of the deck or the top of these two playing cards, it's going to look like a deck. And when I address this, when I talk about this, I refer to it as the deck. I hold it in this hand. I do the transfer as if it's a deck. You've got to ask yourself, what would it look like if this really was a deck going from here to here? What would it look like? And that's your goal. You've got to make it look like that. So I put the, this ace down very carefully into Susan's hand. Bring my hand away from these two playing cards. Because I want to, at the same time I'm doing all this, I want to establish a good distance between me and these two playing cards because of the next step. I need to be, I need a good distance here because I don't want them to think in a few moments time that I was close enough to have done something. That'll make sense in a, in a moment. So I put this down into a hand. I come back here. The next card, watch the deck. So I put it into this hand as if it's a full deck. And this is a very easy thing. I kind of curl my hand up a little bit like, like it looks a bit weird and it's hard to explain other than just showing you. When the deck goes in, I have it so that they can only see the top of it. So I put it here like this. The fingers curled around the side allow um, quite a bit of depth perception manipulation. So it looks like a deep object. It looks like I'm holding more than what I'm holding. Really, I'm just pinching the top two cards between finger one here against the side of the thumb. And the fingers are pretending to curl around an entire deck of playing cards. So 
I'm not in this position. Bear in mind, I'm only in this position for a second, only for a quick moment. So I go from here to here, watch the, the deck. As soon as I put this down, I now show that this hand is empty, big open hand, and then slam. So once I've slammed, I, I can feel the two playing cards have separated. I can feel that. I don't need to worry. There's a, a very specific way that I do this. When the, the two playing cards are here and I slam, I want these two playing cards to kind of fall back into my hand, not forward, backwards into my hand. This does a few things. One, it makes, it, it clearly shows that the hand cannot be hiding a deck in there. The hands are flat together and you can barely see anything from the front because I'm not showing any playing cards from the front angles. They're all at the back where I can see. And nobody can see back here because, because of the way that I'm holding my hands. So I slam, it goes from, this is also why it's important that this hand looks kind of small and all, all curled in when you're holding the deck because it makes this moment look so much bigger, uh, very subtly, very subconsciously. So I'll go here, slam. I'm now gonna hold this pose for a few moments and I'm not even gonna tell them what's happened. They can see for themselves, watch the deck. So now the two playing cards have separated because of the action. They will, they will, there's no control over it. Don't try and control it and let it happen. I do this, I don't even say what's happened. I slowly pull my hands apart as I'm doing this. This hand is pushing those cards together again. And then this hand comes to the back and I straighten the two cards up at the corners like this as I pinch them on the end of my fingers. Now, it, when you do this, you'll see how easy it is to just straighten those two cards up and show them. Especially at that last moment, because I'm gonna straighten like this, pinch them at the corner, finger two is now underneath, finger one on top, the thumb at the very back. And this thumb, the empty hand now is gonna help push those two cards in. So just doing this, I'll do the straightening of these two playing cards so that they look like one playing card. At this moment, when I get to this position where I know that they're straight, I pop them off my thumb like this. So this shows one card without me saying it's one card. It shows one card because it is one card. I don't have to say the third ace and no deck because that's obvious. So the deck vanishes and I'm stood there with one playing card. This is a very important moment now because you're gonna put two playing cards which are held together as one. You're gonna put two playing cards in Susan's hand she has to believe that you only put one playing card in her hand. So your body language is gonna do the rest of the work. I go from here, and I'm not gonna give it to her straight away. We're gonna establish that the deck has vanished and that this is the third ace. I'm gonna wait a few moments and say, and the fourth and final ace. So I'm, I'm talking about the next step before I've completed the third step because I don't want to put this down carefully and then go and the fourth and final because I'm giving them too much time to look down into that I'm just giving Susan and the rest of the audience time to look down and see what I've done because right now is a very important moment so I stay here and I say the fourth and final ace is and then I start to, to I start to not misdirect but direct their attention over to the same pocket over to the same pocket because they've seen me go to that pocket already and as soon as I look down there and I start to come around here with my hand they can kind of fill in the blanks what's that line um, magic is at its best when it has nothing to hide which leads into um, you're not lying to them I'm not lying I'm not lying to them I'm showing them something and I'm allowing them to lie for themselves they're lying to themselves all I'm doing is looking at my pocket and coming around, they fill in the blanks. So as I'm here, that's when I put the ace down and I look over at Susan for a moment to put it down. And then I look at the ace going down, I then look up at her and look back. So this all seems very nonsense and, and very unnecessary, but when it goes down here, she's looking here too. She looks down too, because she wants to see what you're putting in her hand. She wants to establish the third ace. Now I look up at her, that makes her look up at me. At that moment, I simply spread the playing cards. I spread these two playing cards so that I look up 
as soon as I'm, I'm secure and confident that she's looking away from these aces, I quickly spread those two aces before I put them down and then I come away. So she's now holding four aces without knowing it. She thinks that I've just done one, two, three, because I have, I've done one, two, three, but the third one was two playing cards. So in, in kind of a time, in kind of a, a real time, let's say, it's like this. I look, she sees this, she establishes, I look up, I spread them and then I come back. So everybody's looking here, all the attention's here. And the suggestion is now gonna collapse because I'm not suggesting anything, I'm not saying anything. The body language is allowing them to, to believe what they want, which is kind of what I want them to believe. All I'm doing is making them look away from the cards. So they assume I'm gonna to go to this pocket. And I say the fourth and final ace, what this does, it allows me to, to build on that establishment that we already have, this distance between me and the aces. So I step back a whole step further which won't be recognized, they won't see it, they won't feel it. It'll just make sense at the end, it'll add a little extra something. So I take one more step back, very carefully, slowly, not making a point of it, as I go over here. This hand's wide open as if it's gonna go into my pocket and this hand comes back as if to come this way as well, but all I'm doing is showing empty hands. That's all I wanna do at this point. I come here and as soon as that, there's that moment of silence where the anticipation is building, oh, where's that final ace? Is it, oh, is it, is it in his pocket again? What, you know, all those, all that empty space that they fill with those kind of assumptions and questions. I'm back here and, and as I'm working my way back, the thought and final ace is, and I pause, I line up the body language. This gives me so much more time and distance. Look how far away I am from the aces. I can't reach them. I've moved myself away from the situation. I've got all the attention and I've tricked them into coming over here. I said the fourth and final ace is already in your hand. Now, they look down, they see she sees four aces in her hand. This is a very simple, easy, basic trick, but that's a real magical moment, that is. And, and when, she, when the audience, when she wants to analyze this, look how far away I am. I, I couldn't have done anything after putting that third card down. I couldn't have done anything. Even more to the point, the final ace, the ace of hearts, it's not on top. It's not, it, it, if I were to have snuck that into our hand, it would have been on top. Or so then little squirrel peanut brains are gonna think. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the the automatic assumption won't try and figure out that much that it could have been hiding behind the ace of spades. They're just going to assume, wow, it didn't even wasn't even on top. And don't bring that up. Don't bring that up to them. Don't say, oh, and it wasn't even on top. Just let them let that sink in. When you say it was in your hands all along, they look down and it was because it's not even on top. It's a real magical moment. It really is. Everything can be inspected at this point. Um, now that this is done, now we have a true miracle on our hands just to wait us. So we take the aces back. Now the aces might be inspected, they might be being inspected at this point, which is a good thing, which is, is not a problem. At this point, the trick's done and it's kind of irrelevant. It doesn't really matter where the deck went, but this is where we can, we can bring in and introduce a miracle or something really special. When I go to take the deck back out of my pocket, I'm not gonna get the deck that we've just been using. I'm gonna get the deck that we set up from the start. Brand new deck, brand new deck order. This deck is in brand new deck order. Now, a few things happen here in the, the participant in the audience mind. If you reverse this trick, if you were to actually reverse it on film, I never went near this pocket, not for a moment. So there might be someone around, somebody in the audience, even Susan, she might note that, she might know that. So it's kind of impressive when you go, oh, the deck, by the way, the deck, the deck's in my pocket. It's kind of an after thing where they go, what, I didn't even see that, I didn't even see, how, how could he have done that, that's wild. The point is, they just accept that this is the deck we've been using all along, Obviously you need the same back design, you don't bring a pink deck out. So there's a little miracle there in the reverse engineer of it, re reverse engineering of it. However, what we're achieving with this, I like to do this 
this ace is trip towards the end of a set, towards the end of a, a bunch of routines where we've established that the playing cards have been shuffled. This is why I said in the beginning, it is so important that Susan shuffles the playing cards. She's the one who shuffles because of this moment. Now, first of all, I want to get rid of the aces and I'm in a, I'm in a dead moment. I'm in, I'm in a dull, quiet moment after the trick awaiting a new trick but you're letting it sink in you're letting them think about the trick uh you know when you're in a tr in the middle of a trick that everyone's kind of attention is is so forced and focused but we've achieved the trick now so everybody chills out and relaxed this gives me a moment where i need to get these aces back to this deck or at least away from this deck so I, there's a few different ways i can do that i can simply just do it which is what i usually do you know and there's no no one's watching there's no attention so i'll just take the aces pretend to put them on the bottom of the deck put the deck down and just step back we're in, a, we're in that moment before a trick's happening um if you want to apply a method to it a, a methodical way of getting those playing cards to your pocket there's so many things you can do you can pretend to, to lose them all in the deck uh, uh, meanwhile you pass them through this i don't want to teach anything or suggest anything like that because i like the idea that I want you. If you're gonna, I want. If you're gonna perform this, I want you to see what happens if you were to just do this. So I take the, the deck out. And say, oh yeah, the deck was in my pocket. I'll show you something else. I want you to try it, just just for your own benefit, so that you can see that things like that you can get away with. Nobody's looking at that point when you're in the middle of a trick between tricks. Nobody's looking what you're doing. Nobody's looking. Especially with this deck when, when afterwards you can turn the top card over and show an ace because this deck's in brand new deck order or, or show another ace. At this point, I don't like to execute the final deception, which is showing the deck in brand new deck order. I don't like to do that straight away. I like to show maybe one or two more tricks that will allow the deck to stay in brand new deck order. So do a few more simple tricks and then right at the very end, You've got a deck of cards that's in, in order where you can actually say we, you've been we've been shuffling this deck the whole time you've shuffled this deck of playing cards the way that i like to do it i don't like to just spread it out and show that the decks oh by the way the decks in order sometimes that's beneficial sometimes that will work what i like to do especially if you've done a few more tricks is i'm, I'm gonna try something that that I'm practicing, I've been working on this for like 10 years, it doesn't always work. Almost as if you're kind of trying to remember where certain cards are because of what's coming. You're almost suggesting what's about to happen. If you're near a table, it's a very good idea to start executing some false cuts. The more easy and relaxed this feels, if you make it look like it's not a trick but you're just going to try one final thing, the better. Uh, hit some false shuffles, if you can false shuffle, hit some false shuffles right in front of them and then at the very end, because I know that the King of Diamonds is on the bottom and the Ace of Spades is, is on top in this case, I, I usually have this line where I say, if I've done this right, the top card will be the Ace of Spades. Yes, and the bottom card will be the King of Diamonds. Yes, that means this has worked. The deck is now back in brand new deck order. And then, finished, you're done. That's the trick, that's the whole set over. This is one of the, the ways that I like to finish every single time I perform for somebody. The deck will always return to brand new deck order. Now this for me is is something of a, it's kind of a negative thing. It's a bit, I'm a bit obsessive with my playing cards being in order. The deck has always got to be in order. The most powerful tricks I know happen with the deck in order. I don't mean stacked. I don't mean in the stack. I just mean it in order. H through King, H through King, H through King. I don't specifically like this order uh, because this to me is reverse. I like the King of Diamonds to be on top, A spades on the bottom, but still, the fact that I can spread this out and show a deck that's in brand new deck order, especially after we've just done a whole set of tricks where they've shuffled, I've shuffled, that is magical. And they will probably remember that more than any other trick that you did. So that's effing aces. I do love the, the play on words, effing, as if people used to think it was for uh, swearing, the eff swear wording aces, but it's just finding aces. Um, so if you like this, let me know. And uh, I like these short, kind of snappy tricks 
where it's kind of one, two, three, four, and it's, it's done quickly. Uh, if you enjoyed this and if you like these kind of things, let me know. Tons more like this to share with you. Let's go to an outro. That was effing aces. I think it's a very wise decision. I think it's a very beneficial choice for all magicians to have a find a four of a kind style trick in their repertoire. There are so many fascinating and interesting methods for finding playing cards like this, four of a kind, one after the other, each in a very cool way. This is one of my personal favorite versions. And although I have so many other ways of doing this, this one's my favorite because of all those little things that it involves. Uh, a card in the pocket, a deck vanishing, a bit of an aerial action, and then a final surprise. I'll be back very soon with some more dope card trick tutorials. All I ask, make sure you're subscribed so that you get the notification when another tutorial drops. I'll leave a link in this video description to my sizzling new merch. Oh man, this looks And on the final note, if you use this trick or any other of my tricks on the socials on YouTube, you don't need to credit me by the way. I mean, if, you're, if your audience is somebody who loves to watch magic, don't feel like you have to credit the creator because it leads that audience away from your magic. To the method so if you tagged me when you're showing somebody a trick they'll come and find me and they'll learn how to do it so it's not always the best idea i do appreciate watching people do my own work though so i'm always looking thanks thanks for being here appreciate you choosing to spend some time with me i'm daniel madison see you next time